thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you uh, a little bit about the future of Ruby and uh, sort of the things that I think all of us are thinking but maybe not saying. We'll find out. Real quick though, uh, as was said, my name is Joshua Belanco. That's uh, my slide to make you all jealous. This is where I just recently moved to, uh, Boldrum, Turkey. And uh, for those of you wondering why I'm in Turkey, this is the reason. Uh, my wife is actually Turkish. And yes, as I mentioned, I actually uh, just recently, within the past six weeks or so, started with Circle CI. And uh, we do continuous integration, continuous deployment. And I've been told that if you send an email to say hi at Circle CI and mention that you saw this at Rulu, there is a special discount if you sign up. So be sure to take advantage of that. OK, so uh, what's up with Ruby? Some of you may have seen recently uh, Jeff Atwood of Co Coding Horror fame uh, started a new startup called Discourse. And unlike his previous startup, which was entirely .NET based, he decided to go for Ruby with this one, and Rails. And he wrote a blog post giving his reasons why. And two of the reasons that he gave, kind of flattery with insult mixed in, <laughs> was that Ruby is maturing up nicely, and it isn't cool anymore. All right, well, he did pick Ruby, so that, that's something. You may have also seen a blog post recently from the Rubinius guys announcing this Rubinius X project. They were not quite so kind. Uh, that blog post flat out said Ruby is a dying language. Eww. For those of you that are more into charts and graphs, you may be familiar with the Tyobi Programming Community Index. This is what the chart looks like for Ruby. So you see right around 2006, there's a nice big spike up. And then it just kind of peters out as we get towards today. So what is up with Ruby? Oh no, is Ruby really dying? Well, I have a simple answer to this for you, which is, uh, are you at a Ruby conference? I think I am. In fact, I uh, looked just last night, and uh, the rubyconferences.org page has 33 listed with three TBA. And of course, Rulu is right there at the top, which is kind of fun. So how does a dying language have 33 current conferences listed? Well, we're not dead yet. OK, but something is definitely up with Ruby. So in order to understand what exactly is going on, I'd like to take a little trip back in time, about nine years ago. So the year's 2005. Mariah Carey has the number one song. Episode three was released, and uh, Emperor Palpatine was uh, elected pope. And there was this very famous blog post, or screencast, from a uh, little-known Dutch programmer, or Danish, my mistake, whoa. My apologies to the Dutch and Danish, I think. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, so, so 2005 was when uh, Rails hit the scene, and, and not Surprisingly, that's also about the same point in time that that uh, chart spiked up from Tyobi. But actually, I want to go a little further back, 10 years before that even. So the year is 1995. Gangsta's Paradise is the number one song that year. Batman Forever was released. And uh, the Schengen Agreement, interestingly enough, I just discovered this, was actually signed ensuring that nobody would ever be able to understand the political structure of Europe. So. And that year was also the year that Matt's first publicly released a version of Ruby. So 
I think to understand where Ruby is going in the future, it helps to understand where Ruby came from in the past. Another way of thinking about it is, what other bad decisions were we making in 1995? So if we begin at the beginning, what were your choices as a programmer in 1995? Let's say you want to write a web app. What are you going to use? Well, there's C. Now, C has a certain sort of elegance to it. You know, th th this is not bad, all things considered. But there's that include statement up there, right? stdio.h. What if we open up stdio.h? Oof. That, by the way, is like less than 1%. I couldn't even, I like shrunk the font all the way down and still couldn't even get close to getting all of stdio.h on the screen. So, um, yeah, so there's a lot of ceremony around C. Maybe you'd use Java. Everybody remembers public static void main and system out print line because who doesn't love verbosity? Um, so yeah, so there's, there's that. Or uh, maybe you would use Perl, right? Somebody, you know, mashed their hands against the keyboard and out popped a hello world, I guess. These are your choices, right? Not exactly the most fun things to use. And it's probably, you know, in retrospect, kind of obvious, but the question that really needed to be asked is, do we really need header files? Do we really need to be so verbose about our types? Why do we need all these crazy sigils in front of our variable names? Right? And somebody did finally ask that question. It was Matt's, right? He came up with Ruby. Here's Hello World in Ruby. I don't think it gets any simpler than that. And, and Matt's said when he announced Ruby, or maybe a little after, that uh, his goal in creating Ruby was to optimize for programmer happiness. He wants programming to be something we enjoy doing instead of dreading. OK, so, so this, this is a noble goal, right? And this is obviously going to make you a lot happier than C, Java, or Perl. But that leads us to a question. Why? in 1995, didn't C, Java, or Perl optimize for programmer happiness? Were they all just masochists? Did they enjoy pain? All right, that's silly, but maybe there were technical limitations, right? The original C compiler, way, way, way back when, had to be implemented in assembly. Right? And we didn't have a lot of the modern tools that we had. So there were definitely some technical limitations way back when. But we can rule that out pretty quickly because obviously there weren't that many technical limitations because Matt's managed to get around these limitations to implement Ruby. Okay, so if it wasn't a technical limitation, people were just lazy. Maybe nobody wanted to put in the effort to making header files and C obsolete or adding type inference to Java, right? But if you remember Larry Wall's uh, virtues of a programmer, laziness is actually a virtue of a programmer because laziness drives us to do the things that make it so we don't have to be verbose in our types and have extra header files. So if people were truly lazy, then they would have gone ahead and resolved this issue, right? So it wasn't laziness. Now, I can't say for sure, but if I had to guess, I think what it really comes down to is that people were complacent. C works. Java works. Perl sometimes works. So why should we do anything different? Right? We have this tool. We use the tool. We get stuff done. But it's that sort of complacency that's dangerous because somebody will eventually decide, you know what, I'm not happy with this. I want something better, and I'm going to do something about it. In 1995, that was Matt's. But you see, the problem with Matt's goal, optimize for programmer happiness. See, the problem with that is programmers <laughs> are never happy. 
You give us something, we'll find a way to break it. You make things easy for us, we'll find a way to make them hard again. And so just because 1995 programming was made easier, and 1995 programmers were made happier by Ruby, doesn't mean that the same tricks are going to keep us happy. And I think if you look around, you'll find that other programming languages have actually been taking a cue from Ruby and optimizing for programmer happiness. So I just wanted to run through a couple of examples to sort of explain what I mean by that. Common Lisp is one of the oldest programming languages there is, right? If you wanted something other than a linked list in Common Lisp, this is how you would do that, right? So the first three lines are how you make a hash table, right? Gosh, that kind of verbosity makes me almost wish I had Java. Uh, the bottom is how to make an array. And the thing to notice about this, right, and, and the thing that a lot of programmers complain about when they first are exposed to Common Lisp is, it's just a bunch of parentheses. Right, from, from 50 feet away, I mean, I blew this up big, so you kind of have to move a little further back, but you know, from a distance, there is no way to know that that top chunk of code is working with hashes, or the bottom chunk is working with arrays. So you may have heard of a relatively new addition to the Lisp family called Clojure. And Clojure actually very specifically took inspiration from Ruby and the way that Ruby has very convenient literal syntax, or syntax for its literals, and brought that into the world of common Lisp. They committed the cardinal sin of introducing uh, something other than parentheses to the forms, right? So now you've got these curly braces to make a hash. You've got square brackets to make a vector. And all of a sudden, you can look at this code, and you can tell what's going on. You don't have to look at what function names are being called each time. Right? And it should come as no surprise that in a short while, Clojure has actually become one of the most popular lists, if not the most popular list. They didn't do that much, but they optimized for happiness, and people caught on. What about pipes? Right? Concurrency and inter-process communication. As we go to multiple cores and big data centers, this becomes something that we have to worry about more and more. Right? And pipes are old as dirt. But in C, the way you'd work with a pipe is, um, well, not exactly great. So we create the pipe, and we fork a process, then we have to close half the pipe, and write to half of it, and exit the process cleanly, and then in the other half of the fork, we have to close the other half of the pipe, and then we can read, and then we can finally get our message. Interprocess communication, wonderful, right? Well, here's the thing, in Ruby, not that much better. I mean, yeah, we got rid of some of the type signatures and you know, we don't have to do quite as many song and dance routines around forking, but uh, we're still talking about creating a double-ended pipe, forking a process, closing half the pipe on each end, and finally being able to communicate between processes. Well, another language took a look at the problem of inter-process communication and decided this should be easier. You've probably heard of Go. So this is how you send a message between processes in Go. Or I don't even know if they're processes because they even abstracted away the exact mechanism for making things run concurrently, right? I just say Go. And maybe it's a fork, maybe it's a thread. Doesn't matter, right? I have a channel. I can put things on one end, I can take them off the other, and I can run these processes or functions or whatever concurrently and communicate, right? 
easier makes me happier looking at something like this than the more drawn out pipe code in C or Ruby. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about multi-methods, because this is something that's been around forever. Uh, Lisp explored multi-methods ages ago. But I, I still think that people don't quite appreciate the power of them. The classic example of a multi-method is if you were going to program a game of asteroids. So you've got a ship, and you've got asteroids. And asteroids can collide into other asteroids or a ship can collide into an asteroid. And we have to do different things depending on what's going on in the actual collision. Now, if you were going to program this in Ruby, you'd probably do something like this, where you have a class for your ship, you have a class for asteroids, and then you implement a method in ship. You'd have to implement the same method in asteroid, by the way. And inside the method, you say, well, I'm going to collide with something. What is that something? I don't know. Let me use an if. But if is kind of ugly, right? Maybe there's a better way to do it. Well, you may have heard of a very, very young language called Julia. Julia takes a lot of inspiration from Ruby. But it also adds something. In this case, we can create, they don't call them classes, they call them types. But we can create a type for a ship and an asteroid and then we can actually just write our function to take arguments of either a ship colliding with a ship, or a ship with an asteroid, or an asteroid with a ship, or an asteroid with an asteroid. We don't have those ifs. Right? We write each type of collision once. And then all we have to do is call collide with two arguments. And the correct implementation is called for us. Right? Multi-method er, yeah, multi dispatch. So another thing that, uh, you know, when you use it, makes things pretty, pretty fun, makes me happy. So this is just a small sampling, right? I didn't want to, I'm already worried about taking too much of your time today, so I didn't want to go too much further in depth, but I, I just wanted to give you a small sample of how if you look at what other programming languages are doing, people are still trying to optimize for happiness. And they're coming up with interesting ways to do so. So is Ruby toast? Is there nothing to be done? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is that Ruby definitely is not going anywhere. That's the good news. It's very easy to pick on Ruby. It's very easy to nitpick specific areas where Ruby could be better. But the bottom line is, is when was the last time you used threads in any language? How many of you have programmed with threads in the last week? OK, we've got, call it 20%, not even, 15% of the audience. OK. It's definitely something that needs to be done, but it's not the majority case, right? If we're talking about 80-20 optimization, it's probably in the 20%. And chances are that we don't actually even need to optimize for threads if we can come up with a better way to do concurrency, right? Something like what Go has. And as it turns out, Rubyists are a creative bunch, and uh, there are libraries out there that make threaded programming easier. So don't give up hope just yet. Something else that I think people maybe focus on a little too much is that there's this trend recently away from dynamic languages. Right? Around the time that Ruby came onto the scene, there were almost exclusively statically typed languages and, and Perl. And all of a sudden, Python came onto the scene, Ruby came onto the scene. It looked like maybe dynamic languages were going to be the next thing. And then slowly, people kind of moved away from them again. And now we've got things like Haskell and 
other languages that focus more on types. And I think we, we forget that type Dynamically typed versus statically typed is not just a question of what the latest fad is. There are actually good reasons to have a dynamically typed language. So here's a trivial example. <clears throat> I've got the power function in Ruby. Now here's the interesting thing about a power function. If you take an integer raised to an integer power, you get back an integer. But if you take an integer raised to a negative integer power, you get back something that's not an integer. Now in Ruby, no sweat. 2 squared, 4. It's a fixed num. 2 raised to the negative 2, 1 fourth. It's a rational. If I had raised it to the negative 2.0, I would have gotten the float equivalent. So we have one function that's able to take both a positive number argument and a negative number argument, and give back the right response, because it's a dynamic method. right? I'm not restricting myself to only one return type. What about Julia? So I was just telling you how great you know, the ability to define types and dispatch on types is in Julia. But something interesting happens when you use the power function in Julia. Two raised to the Two, right? Two squared. It's four. Great. Two raised to the negative two. Error, domain error in power by squaring at infunx, blah, 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 blah. It can't do it. And the reason it can't do it is because if you look at how Julia has decided to define the square function, they insist that all of the types be the same. The types in and the types out be the same. Well, two raised to a negative number is not an integer even though both of the arguments are. So now all of a sudden you're forced to do crazy typecasting or write more method implementations, all because we insisted on consistent types in our functions. right? And this is not an easy problem to solve, by the way. Haskell can't solve this because the difference is not in types. Two and negative two are the same type. right? They're both integers. It's just that one happens to be positive and one happens to be negative. And finally, guess what? People are still using Java. People are still using C. Right? Those languages that were around in 1995 that were causing enough pain to cause somebody like Matt to create a whole new language just so that he could be happy writing programs again. Those languages are still around. They haven't gone anywhere. And one of the reasons that they are still around is because they have this wealth of tools and libraries and this entire community of developers built up around them. And that community is a really big source of inertia to keep pushing a language forward. And Ruby's got that too. So finally, I just want to run through my personal wish list, because I do think that while Ruby is not in any imminent danger, we do have to make sure that we aren't being complacent. And I think while there isn't a risk that Ruby is going to die, there is a risk that Ruby might stagnate. And so how do we avoid that? Well, one thing is when it comes to web programming, Ruby owns the back end, Rails, no problem. But people are moving to the front end. And guess what? JavaScript is the story on the front end. It's too late to try and do anything about that. Let's just give up hope of ever using anything other than JavaScript. Right? It is the assembly for the web. But that doesn't mean that we have to abandon Ruby. Right? The Clojure community didn't want to use JavaScript, so they wrote ClojureScript. Hey! What do you know? Ruby has an implementation that runs on top of JavaScript. It would be really great to see somebody build an actual framework using Opal. But you know what? Web programming is so 2010. 
Mobile is the future. Well, as you heard earlier today, we've got an answer for that too. So go out and build some mobile apps with Ruby. And finally, I think what we really need to do is maybe be willing to look past some blind spots that we've had for a long time as a community. Ruby has always prided itself on being a dynamically typed language, but I think if you look at what Julia is doing with optional typing, you'll see that types might not be all bad. I'm not saying we should be st statically typed. That would be the last thing I would want. But I think in this day, we understand that types are a lot more than just public static void main. And finally, we may have to be willing to kill a couple of sacred cows along the way. In this case, this is the top section of the header for Ruby.h, which describes the Ruby C API. And you may not have ever had to interact with the C API directly, but indirectly, it's definitely holding you back. A lot of the trickery that's been required to make the GC better is required because of the handcuffs placed by the C API. Now, there are a lot of really great extensions and libraries that depend on the C API. So getting rid of it would be painful, but it would also open up a lot of opportunities for improving performance, improving concurrency, and building a better Ruby overall. So finally, will I still be using Ruby 20 years from now? I don't know about you, but for me personally, maybe, maybe not. But in asking myself this question, I realized that there is one thing that I do know for sure, and uh, not to sound cliche, but I think what we have as a programming community has not been replicated anywhere else and didn't really exist before Ruby. And I think if nothing else, even if you do move on to another language in your day job, as some of us have, that you remember what it is about the Ruby community that you enjoy so much and bring it with you wherever you go. So, thank you. <laughs>